coming up. Okay, we're good to go. All right, good morning, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Way to Help. Today, we're talking about post concussion syndrome and is it an immunological condition? I'm joined by Kathy. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so last week we talked about the blood brain barrier. So, the blood brain barrier again in review. And good morning to everyone who's joining. Hope everybody's having a nice Saturday. So the blood brain barrier creates a barrier, just as people have designated it. So we need a barrier so that large molecules from our body don't necessarily go into the brain, particularly if those molecules are inflammatory or if those molecules may be immune cells that would go into the brain and create excessive inflammation. So that's what Kathy and I talked about really at length last week. Now, Kathy, did you have any questions from last week? Oh, I read something this morning that kind of I thought was interesting. It, it alluded to the blood-brain barrier being almost like a tea bag. That, mm, you know, it lets the glucose and different stuff into the brain that's needed, filters the other stuff and keeps the stuff in the middle that's supposed to be there <laughs> as, right. as uh, protection. So I thought that was pretty good. And I, and I think folks maybe need to remember what we talked about last week. You know, there are certain bad things that can get through there, anesthesias and uh, antibiotics, different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. that can cause different issues with the brain. So, yeah, this is kind of a complex thing. And I'm, I know all these parts together is what makes it interesting for you when we talk about the brain and when you get into to this, the brain itself and all of that. So, um, yeah, we all know now we've got this blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. We've got a pretty good idea what it does for us. So when we get into concussion and post-concussion syndrome, then we need you to give us some information there. So circling back, so on that note, then circling back to something I alluded to last week, but I probably did not elaborate as well as I could have on, was a study done in 2013 where they looked at college football players. And they were evaluating college football players who didn't have concussions but had what are referred to as subconcussive head impact. So basically they're just going throughout the season, they're getting hit, but they're not getting, you know, they're not enduring the types of injuries that would technically uh, designate a concussion. So then they were monitoring their blood during the game and they found that during the game they were looking at this protein called S100B, which is a protein from astrocytes in the brain. And so they saw that during the game, this protein from the brain was high in the bloodstream of these football players. And so that's extremely significant. So you have this brain protein floating around in the bloodstream, and they found within 24 hours after the football game, this protein had been cleared from the blood. So basically, it was a transient issue that happened because of the head injuries. Now, they then did further studies, and they found that the the football players were actually making immune cells to this protein like 50% of the time. So in essence, their bodies were creating an autoimmune response to this protein. So that's extremely significant also. So in essence, that's the first line of evidence that maybe we have some sort of autoimmune response occurring in the brain of football players. Does that make sense, Kathy? Anything I yes, should? Yes, it does. Because okay. just like any other part of the body, I mean, when when something's going on there, the other signals are just like a football team. Hey, there's something going on here. Everybody, let's get together and, <clears throat> and go attack this because yep. this isn't supposed to be going on. One hundred percent. And they've seen these antibodies to S100 beta in other illnesses like Alzheimer's. They've seen it there. Um, I think there are a few others. A stroke is one where you'll see antibodies to S100B or S100 beta. Some people refer to it differently. So that's rather significant because I'm not saying here that post-concussion syndrome is an autoimmune disease. Technically, for something to be an autoimmune disease, we have to have defined immunological characteristics like multiple sclerosis to say that the immune system is mounting a response to the brain. However, these researchers from 2013 went back and investigated and found that there were also other immune cells that were causing damage to the architecture of the nerves. So one big concern is Kathy and I were talking about relative to CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. These are these guys who play contact sports, boxing, football, 
whatever, and then 20, 30 years down the line, or maybe even sooner than we thought, they have evidence of brain damage, they have evidence of kind of like an Alzheimer's-like condition, but it's affecting the prefrontal and frontal lobes more than just the memory area. And what they find in these individuals is accumulation of tau protein or phosphorylated tau protein. Tau is basically like the two by fours of your neurons. So these researchers who saw the high S100B in the bloodstream also found immune cells that could lead to the breakdown of tau. So basically kind of like, you know, the bolts that hold the two by four into the floor, they were finding immune cells to those bolts. So that's pretty significant as well. So this is just more and more information connecting the fact that concussions are real. Why do some people develop post-concussion syndrome and others do not? It's probably because in some individuals, this immune response and blood brain barrier, the blood brain barrier breaks down so much that the immune system is able to traffic into the brain, keeping the inflammation going, breaking down the architectural proteins. And in some people, that process just keeps going for years and years and years. And maybe that's the pathological mechanism of CTE. Okay. I read one this morning. I think it was a combination between Stanford and like Trinity College in Dublin, where mm -hmm. they had worked with rugby players and martial arts fighters. Mm -hmm. And that study was involving not concussion, but repeated mild injuries to the brain. Mm -hmm. And what they were seeing was the consistency of injury to the blood brain barrier. And what I found was really interesting was in the martial arts, somebody has developed a mouth guard that measures the severity of the blows and so mm -hmm. forth and, and mm -hmm. reads a whole bunch of information. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, holy crap, <laughs> this is pretty important. <laughs> and, uh -huh. and what that can do. So, I mean, our technology is pretty impressive. But if you can start getting readings and findings on that stuff, then we ought to be able to get some serious answers as to maybe what what kind of equipment or preventative measures we can take to maybe, you know, soften these blows, whatever we can do that's mm -hmm. going to help these kids or, or players. Um, and, I mean, you know, we talk football, we talk rugby, we, we talk martial arts. I mean, we, know, we all know, um, you know, Muhammad Ali, Right. What, what happened to him over the right. years. I mean, to me, that's almost like a poster child for this sort of thing. Because, right. I mean, blows to the head repeatedly, this is what you get. Mm -hmm. And and if it's a football player, boxer, whatever. So, but at the same time, like I said, you always mention the mother who hits her head on the table when she comes up from picking up the fork that got dropped or whatever. <clears throat> right. Concussion can come from anywhere mm -hmm. and uh, to anyone. Just depends mm -hmm. on the injury. And like I said, some people seem to be more susceptible to it than others 100 uh, percent. yeah and maybe you know but we all know car accidents you know if people fall really bad like i took that tumble last year you wanted to do an mri to make sure i didn't do some sort of damage right my head did it hit that floor pretty good <laughs> 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 i think the floor won that battle but um <sighs> it's it's a thing to to realize and uh maybe we should just go ahead right now and go through those symptoms of just concussion again so everybody's kind of got those in their mind that if they've got family members whatever that they're paying attention to these symptoms and then we'll go into more of what we you know how we need to treat it how we need to look at it what mm -hmm. kind of testing we need to be looking at that sort of thing 100 mm percent. -hmm. so some of the symptoms that people will experience after head injuries include dizziness, disorientation, lots of times headaches, lots of times they may just not know where their body is located, just a general feeling off. Fatigue is a really common symptom. And then I will say maybe in the latter period, two to four weeks removed, it's really common to see people who have depression, they may have anxiety, they may have post-traumatic stress disorder, they may have startle responses, or all of a sudden they're afraid of somebody creeping up on them and they never had this before. These are the common symptoms of post-concussion syndrome. So really difficulty concentrating, difficulty focusing, headaches, uh, poor stamina, fatigue, pretty much everything I mentioned, those are the symptoms. And we also had some questions come into us this week, Kathy, as well. Good. About, yeah, about basically if we damage neurons in the brain, can they regenerate? And the answer is actually the more severe the brain injury, 
the more likely neurons are to regenerate. But namely, that's in the hippocampus. There's two areas in your brain that can grow new brain cells. One is the olfactory bulb, which is right there, right through here is your olfactory bulb. The other is your hippocampus. The hippocampus is deep in the brain. A lot of you have heard me talk about it. it's way deep in the temporal lobes. It's always hard to coordinate my hands opposite because this is a mirror. So deep down in there is your hippocampus. And that's the other area that can regenerate neurons. So the more severe the head injury, actually, the more likely you are for regenerative capacity in your hippocampus. Now to take that another step further, as we pull the brain apart. So you all have heard me talk about the corpus callosum, this white matter tract that connects each hemisphere of the brain. Now current research is showing that if we do a specific type of MRI that will look at the white matter tracts in your brain or axons, they find that the corpus callosum heals from the back forward. So there was another question about, you know, whether these nerves can heal. Well, technically, the regenerative capacity, like I said, is more in the hippocampus with more severe head injuries, but also know that if the wires are damaged, the wires actually can heal, and they heal in a posterior to anterior fashion. And one of the things being discussed in the literature is that if somebody has signs that they're not healed in the anterior portion of the brain, in this corpus callosum, should they return to sports? Should they return to the activity which maybe caused them to have this problem? So that's a current topic of debate in the literature. Another question we had come in was, so if somebody has a concussion, what is the, what did they say? I forget the exact question, uh, the exact terminology, but kind of like what is the statute of limitations, I think is what they used. So what is the critical time period to determine if they will heal and be able to come back versus not being able to come back? And that time period is debated, but it seems to be between one and three years. So basically, if you have a head injury and you develop post-concussion syndrome, if you're not better by a year, by some accounts, and other people say by three years, you're probably not going to get better in terms of your symptomatology. And that's where Dr. Carrick, who basically created this field called functional neurology, he took a large group of post-concussion syndrome patients that had had it for over a year, and he put them through his treatment modalities, and 80% of them were better after his treatment, which is pretty significant because these people technically were just told, you know, you're going to have to deal with this forever. You're never coming out of it. So, and, and he was a mentor of yours, and those modalities are things that you use daily. Correct? Exactly, yeah. He's the one that created this profession, and I have followed him, and he's a mentor, yeah. So, 100%. And then we had another question about temporal lobe scarring. So, your temporal lobes, as I bring the brain model around, are right through here. This is where you hear. You also have a lot of visual processing in your temporal lobes. Memory is deep in the temporal lobes, and some individuals who have seizure disorders will overexcite their brain so much that they'll develop scarring in the temporal lobes. Someone asked, is there something we can do for that? I can't say definitively yes for the scarring. I don't have a definitive answer on that. What I will say is it seems that all the research on seizure disorders is going towards an inflammatory or autoimmune uh, hypothesis, and that's why you'll see a lot of people who have seizures, they take CBD, what is CBD? CBD is anti-inflammatory, and they seem to get some results from the CBD because it's helping with the inflammation in the brain. So, we got all that, and then we had a question here. Uh -huh. Go ahead. We had a question, what is the treatment? Really, and this is a great question, the treatment entails decreasing systemic inflammation as much as possible. So we have to calm down the inflammation in the body as much as we can. A lot of people are talking about this in different ways. Some people are saying you need to take 15 grams of fish oil a day. Other people are saying you need to be on the autoimmune paleo diet. Other people are saying, no, you need to support the mitochondria. My opinion is you probably need a combination of all those factors to reduce the inflammation. And then it's important to go into the brain and start rehabbing the areas of the brain that have been damaged. One of the things that Kathy knows I'm most excited about is I feel that we're able to do that as well as anyone at this point in time because we do advanced imaging, different than your standard MRI and CT scans that will show what areas of your brain are damaged or still damaged. So we can say, okay, it's this part of your 
into your cingulate gyrus that's not working correctly, we're gaining density, we're losing density, we need to create a treatment directed for that area. And then we can also create neuroplasticity-based exercises for areas of the brain that are not functioning correctly. For example, on this discussion of the blood-brain barrier, a lot of evidence says that the blood-brain barrier will actually break down involving the cerebellum. So it's not uncommon for us to see post-concussion patients who have some level of dizziness or some level of motion sensitivity or some level of nausea or POTS. We've talked about POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is where an individual stands up and all of a sudden their blood pressure drops, their heart rate starts to go up. They find that two thirds of post-concussion patients have disorders of blood pressure, meaning their blood pressure is either low or their blood pressure is low and their heart rate is going high. Well, where's that coordinated from? It's coordinated from that cerebellum. And research is showing that's where the blood brain barrier is also breaking down. So we give exercises to that cerebellum to get it firing better again so that we coordinate blood pressure again. And the research is also definitive that if you can fix the POTS, lots of times you can fix the post-concussion syndrome. So kind of trying to put it all together, what is the treatment? The treatment is addressing where the brain has been damaged and then addressing all the inflammatory components that are keeping the neurological damage going. That's the treatment. And that's the thing I read this morning, and I think you alluded to it last week, is, you know, when you have a concussion, the brain moves, it hits the skull, the damage happens when that brain is bouncing back and forth within the skull, but most of us would think the damage would be on the outside of the brain, where in a lot of cases, there's damage internally into the brain, and it depends definitely on where this damage happens and and how uh, severe I'm so glad you said that because that was a point that we mentioned last week and that the study came out from, uh, I think it was Rochester, New York. I think it was this year where they took, I believe it was 47 football players and they did MRIs before the season. They had accelerometers on their helmets, kind of like what Kathy is saying with the mouth guard where they can sense forces being transmitted to the head. So they had an accelerometer on the helmet so they could tell if somebody hit their head directly or if their head twisted and, you know, went forward and to the side, whatever. You get it, rotational versus linear uh, forces. And they found that when individuals had rotational forces applied to the brain, even in subconcussive head impacts, that those forces, basically it's like wringing the brain like it's a towel. So, you know, we, our hair is wet in the shower, we got a towel that's wet and we're going to wring it. Well, the inner portion of the brain tissue is actually what gets a lot of the force. And they found that this area that I'm pointing to here, which is referred to as the midbrain, is one of the key areas of the brain that is selectively damaged. Why is that important? Well, the midbrain deals with light and sound coming into the brain. And I will say, having worked with scores of post-concussion patients, so many of them have light sensitivity. They have sound sensitivity. The emotion bothers them. And why is that? Well, your entire visual field in terms of something that probably most people aren't aware of is that we have a map of everything in our brain. So you may be able to see here on the video, it says trunk, neck, head. And for those YouTubers, you can see it says trunk, head, neck. That's your somatosensory map in your parietal lobe. So basically, if you touch one area of the body, the other side of the parietal lobe is going to light up. Well, that's a map. And we're getting a little echo, Kathy. I don't know if something changed on my end or your end. So we have a map of our sensation. We also have a map of our visual world. And that map of our visual world is in the midbrain. It's in the tectum as it's termed. And so they found that that's where the damage is primarily located with these rotational forces, which is something my mentor has been talking about for a long time in terms of these maps for the visual world changing. And that's why we use eye movements so much in the diagnosis of concussion. And that's why now eye movements are a predictive factor of whether somebody will develop post-concussion syndrome or not. So that's a, a long answer, but I'm glad that you brought that up. So, my next question would be if we're talking about a lot of this damage happening with junior high and high school college athletes, that sort of thing. And you mm-hmm. and I've discussed in the past that your brain is not fully developed until what 25, something like that. 
Uh, yeah, I think it's 25 for males around there, 22 for females. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so is there that much more ability to heal or is it worse the other way because you are younger and you have this damage that it's more severe because your brain hasn't developed all the way? I would say it's is more the latter. Yeah, I, okay. I can't cite a study on that, but I would say it's more the latter. And yeah, pediatric concussion is pretty significant because you have a developing brain. You have frontal lobes that are not fully myelinated yet. And then now you're <clears throat> bringing injury and insult to that area. So certainly I would argue that it's worse in a pediatric patient. And that's why now something you were talking about in terms of the helmets, they're looking at now this neck device for soccer players, which is, it's almost like, it's like a choker almost, but it applies pressure to the jugular vein to bring more fluid back into the brain. And they find that the effects from head injuries are, are much less in the brain wearing this choker device. Kind of interesting. Sorry, I don't have a better word for that, but you all know what I mean. It's like a tight necklace. Right. Yeah. And I was talking with friends last night. We were talking about the brain and a lot of the stuff that you do and what you can do to heal things or to, to turn things around. And I mentioned that really the most concussions or the most severity thing seems to be in girls soccer mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they're like are you kidding me and I'm like well somebody kicked a ball 60 miles an hour and you just tried to hit it with your head at the other end of the field mm -hmm. you know it's no different than two cars coming at each other and the damage that you do to the front end of a vehicle so I mean people really need to be able to visualize or think about how much trauma is actually happening mm -hmm. to the brain when it happens. 100%. And also they're finding that neck muscle mass is really important for preventing concussions. So that's another thing. So for anybody who's looking at, you know, preseason training, if you are a soccer player, focusing on your neck muscle mass may not be a bad idea. And they find that is actually protective. And then we had a few other questions pop up. Can POTS be a result of concussions? That's from Kim. Absolutely. 100%. Uh, that's a big, big issue. And then we had some other comments, but yes, so that's where we're at. I think I, think I addressed everything. Mm, any other questions you had on your side, Kathy? I'm going to take you off topic for a minute okay. just because we talked about the brain slamming back and forth in the skull there and what happens. So, Again, you know me, I like to visualize what happens on this, but when I when you talk about that, for some reason in my head it comes in shaken baby syndrome and what happens mm -hmm. to that poor child when mm -hmm. that happens. Basically the same thing, but the brain's so undeveloped. I'm assuming blood brain barrier, everything just kind of blows apart when a kid when a baby goes through something like that. I would assume so. And they have even I believe there's some association with shaken baby and odontoid fractures. So your C two vertebra it has like a peg that sticks up like this, and then your first cervical vertebra wraps around it. And I'm pretty sure they've seen a, a high association with shaken baby and fractures of that odontoid peg. The result is that then the cervical spine can move freely and it can damage the spinal cord and the lower brain stem is right there. So that's thought to be part of it as well. Yeah. Is it ever possible for an infant to survive that? And if so, I mean, is there any way to repair it, I guess? Um, more, and that gets into more of the severe traumatic brain injury. So much of what we're talking about are subconcussive head impacts and mild traumatic brain injury, which basically is synonymous with concussions. Once you get into the more severe brain injury, certainly there can be healing. I mean, if the individual survives, a lot of it is based on reducing inflammation in the brain because we have swelling in a, an anatomical space that doesn't have any room to move. So yeah, I would say if, the swelling is curtailed, then the chance and again, of survival so it's a is higher. Of getting the, the swelling down, getting the inflammation down and out of that, and mm -hmm. I think what some of the other things I looked at when they were talking about uh, fixing the brain or repairing some of that stuff, you mentioned the inflammation, but they I saw normalize your blood sugar, mm -hmm. deal with deal with infections and toxins, reduce your stress, avoid sleep loss. Healthy brain circulation. I'm not quite sure how we're supposed to make that happen. I'm assuming mm -hmm. there's medications or something for that. And reduce your homocysteine levels and glutamate levels. What what are those two involved? Uh, so basically, homocysteine is an inflammatory protein in our body, and uh, or not protein. It's really an inflammatory 
molecule in the body. And so it is particularly important for vascular inflammation. So we've talked about MTHFR. MTHFR is this one gene that basically codes an enzyme that converts inactive folic acid to active folic acid. Well, if you can't do that, one of the critical factors that happens is homocysteine goes up. Homocysteine in the brain is a bad thing. Homocysteine is high in the brains. And we just had a comment about, could we do a video on schizophrenia? Homocysteine metabolism is important for schizophrenia. Homocysteine metabolism is important for bipolar disorder. Homocysteine metabolism is super important for vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is the second most common cause of dementia behind Alzheimer's disease. So homocysteine is very important. So basically it's an inflammatory byproduct. They used to think that it causes coronary artery disease. Some people say yes, some people say no. Irregardless, it's really important for the brain. I learned a lot this morning. Okay, good, good. I hope everybody else did. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was action packed. And our last question is, you mentioned CBD, does THC free also work for decreasing inflammation? And I would say, I can't speak directly to that because I haven't done a research uh, review on that in a couple of years. So my knowledge is that it's mainly CBD, THC is psychoactive, but I could be totally wrong on that. So I don't know. So I'm not sure on that, Teresa, my apologies. But yeah, hopefully uh, later this year we can do some more talks on things like schizophrenia and bipolar. I started to do that last year. I'm hoping to get to that this year, but right now we're gonna hit brain injury is pretty hard. So I think we pretty well summarized how the blood brain barrier is affected, how the blood brain barrier then allows when it's broken down for our immune system to in essence attack brain tissue. And then the proposed hypothesis is, well, what is this doing to architectural proteins in the brain if this keeps going, if somebody keeps having subconcussive head impacts for 15 years? or they're metabolically unhealthy and they have a lot of inflammation in their body and this all is just perpetuating through time. And what is that doing to neurological inflammation and frontal lobe function? So I think that's it. Kathy, anything else before I close? I got to open the door for everybody at the no, front. No, I think that was really good. I think we covered a lot of stuff. I'm looking forward to next week. Okay. All right, we'll be back next week, everyone. Send us your questions. I'll try and put up a post on Friday reminding all of us of that again, and then uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, everyone, have a good day. Okay. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba.